that. So if you're following along in the Red Etz Chaim, we are on page 317. We are beginning a new book in the Torah, the book of Shemot or Exodus. And uh, it begins, and not surprisingly, uh, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Israel with Jacob, each coming with his household. And it gives you the, um, the full list of uh, his children, uh, excluding, of course, Joseph, uh, who was already in Egypt. So it says, the total number of the persons that were of Jacob's issue came to 70, Joseph being already in Egypt. Now, this actually, you can get a little nudniki here. And if you go back to the previous list, what you will see is there are 70 people in the family. Yeah, I think I'm the only one here. There we go. So there are 70 people in the family, including Jacob. But it says here, the total number of persons that were of Jacob's issue were 70. And so this would be 70 plus Jacob. And so you say, well, where's, where's the, um, you know, how do you, how do you resolve this, um, this discrepancy here? Um, and the way the, the rabbis resolve this is, a, is an interesting midrash that there were 70 people, including Jacob, who, um, who set out from the land of Canaan, but there were 70 plus Jacob who entered the land of Egypt um, because as they were entering, as they were crossing the border, um, Yocheved is born. Yocheved being a uh, um, uh, child of, uh, of, 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 of the tribe of Levi, um, and of course, Moses's mother. So Moses's mother is born in a liminal state. She is not quite an Egyptian, not quite born in the land of Canaan. Um, she sort of occupies this middle ground as, as will her son. And it seems like being sort of off kilter a little bit, being off base being a little bit outside the, the, the boundaries um, is exactly what we're going to need um, in, in, um, in, in the years to come. So that's, that's what they do with, um, with this, uh, this number trying, to, trying to, to ease that discrepancy. Okay, I've got a question about that. Wouldn't that make her really old? By the it time would make her super born. old. Just, yes. I don't know. I don't know what the time frame was, but they were in Egypt for a long time and Moses wasn't yes, yes. hundreds of years old when they left. Sure, sure. So, so this is actually, this is a point of debate. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to sort of break down in that regard. Um, but when, the, um, when in Genesis 15, God tells Abraham that your descendants are going to be in slavery for 400 years, the rabbis say that counts the time that the patriarch spent in the land of Canaan. So the actual slavery in Egypt or the actual sojourn in Egypt is only 210 years. Um, but this is said obliquely, this is said confusingly, so that the Israelites will think they have a 400 year period of slavery and when the redemption comes after only 210 years um it uh, it comes to to demonstrate to them the uh, the awesome power of god and 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 through through moses and aaron uh, but they were they were surprised by it because they had done the math wrong um but yeah so if you say that um the sojourn in egypt lasts for 210 years and if you say that Moses, who lives to 120, um, and dies at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness, that makes him 80 at the Exodus. So you do the math there, and he is born um, 130 years after the Israelites enter Egypt. 
which according to this Midrash is when his mother is born. So his mother is 130 years old when he is born. Rashi doesn't like this. Rashi says, if this were true, it would be a greater miracle than Sarah giving birth to Isaac at age 90. And therefore the Torah should have mentioned it. Yeah. There should have been some reference to this. Um, and other people respond to Rashi, sort of trying to explain why it's said obliquely in the Torah when, um, when, when the, the miracle of Sarah's um, birth of Isaac is so, um, so, so pronounced, uh, so emphasized. Um, not, none, of, none of the solutions are really fantastic to, uh, to explain that. Um, it, it, it is notable, as long as we're having fun with numbers, that if, um, if these numbers add up, then Moses is born, as I mentioned, 130 years after the entrance into Egypt, um, when his mother is 130 years old. Um, that number 130 is also the same number that Jacob says when he speaks to Pharaoh. He says, I'm 130 years old and my years have been few and painful, or that's a paraphrase. Um, and so is Jacob speaking of his own life or is he speaking prophecy, not about the last 130 years, but what will happen 130 years from, from that date that our, our Redeemer will be born, who will, who will free us from slavery. It's possible. It's possible. All right. So the total, let's see. Yeah, the total number of persons that were Jacob's issue came to 70, Joseph being already in Egypt. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the Israelites were fertile and prolific. They multiplied and increased very greatly so that the land was filled with them. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So this is, once again, this is akin to Rebecca's uh, earlier question. I mean, what's the time frame here? Is there really only one king in between? Is there really, I mean, this is, depending on, on who you ask, 200 years, 400 years. It seems like there should be a, a number of pharaohs in that time. There, there, there really should be a vast number. So who is this? We don't have any names. We're not given any names. We have a lot of pharaohs who show up in our story, and we have no way of knowing who's who. We've got the pharaoh who, well, I mean, we could take it all the way back. We have the pharaoh who interacted with Abraham. We have the pharaoh who um, hired Joseph to be his prime minister. That appears to be the one who's dying here. The old king, the old pharaoh dies, and a new king arises over Egypt who does not know Joseph. So that's pretty clear what's going on there. But then is this the same pharaoh who is going to um, order the slaughter of the children? Is this the same pharaoh who, whose daughter rescues Moses and raises him in the court? Is this the same pharaoh who will chase us into the sea. There's no way to know. I mean, we have, we have our traditions, we have our legends. Um, on a literary perspective, it seems not to matter especially much. The Pharaoh is symbolic. The Pharaoh stands for Egypt and that's just, that's just what it is. It, it doesn't really matter all that much which one it is. Um, but it does matter, of course, when you want to make these stories a little bit um, a little bit richer, when you want to emphasize Moses being the, you know, the prince of Egypt. And in the movie of that name, they, uh, they go out of their way to emphasize that um, the Pharaoh who Moses is interacting with, uh, you know, let my people go, all of that, that is the son of the uh, the pharaoh that he grew up with so this is his own sort of stepbrother in a sense um or or you know someone someone he, he he grew up with from from very young childhood it could be true i mean it could be it's 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 a it's a fun literary move to take it in that direction um you don't have to um 
there, there, there's certainly room for, you know, multiple dynasties to arise and for Pharaoh to be overthrown and replaced with a new Pharaoh. Um, or in, in Jewish literature, there's also plenty of room for people to live a very long time. So it could just be that we have a couple of Pharaohs in this story. We had one who died and now we've got a new one and he's going to be the one throughout the whole rest of the book of Exodus. Um, it's possible. It's possible. All right. So the king said to his people, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. So Pharaoh seems to have a distinctive motive here, which is, I mean, if you take it at face value, it's slightly more benign. It's slightly more altruistic than, um, hey, look, free slaves, which, I mean, plenty of people, plenty of cultures, plenty of civilizations have, have acted that way. There's some people, they could be our slaves, let's go take them. That's not what the Pharaoh is saying here. He's not saying, wouldn't it be great to have some more slaves? He's saying these people who live in our country aren't us, they're not assimilating, they're not joining into the body politic of Egypt, um, and they could be trouble. They could be trouble. They could be a fifth column. If we're ever invaded, they could rise up against us, join the invaders. Um, we know that, that that did, in fact, happen at various times in Egyptian history. Egyptian history, like so many uh, national histories, is sort of uh, um, uh, this sort of never-ending list of, you know, these people came in or Pharaoh invited in this tribe to serve as his soldiers. And they did for a while until they overthrew the Pharaoh and the soldiers became the new king. Um, I mean, this, this sort of thing happens. Um, and so Pharaoh is, you know, it's not quite altruistic, but he does seem to be speaking, at least hypothetically, <coughs> about the national good, about the national benefit here. Um, and, and, you know, he, he sees a problem um, it's not a problem for him personally. It's a problem for Egypt. It's a problem for the nation. And he's going to do what he needs to do to, um, to take care of his country, which in a sense is his charge as, uh, as the king. So Yo, please, Rebecca. Yeah, so it's, as I'm thinking about it, it's kind of like the, because you'd think it would be great, like we got a bigger population, more people on our side if there was a war, but it's almost the fact that the Jews didn't assimilate that made them the threat. Right, right. Yeah. You know, had they, after a few generations, forgotten their ancestry, forgotten they were Jewish, just became good Egyptians, uh, they probably wouldn't have had this conversation. It probably it, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been a problem. Um, this is, um, you know, this is this is about this is about distinctiveness. And, you know, I mean, not to, you know, the, the situation in 21st century United States is, is incredibly different than in the ancient world. Um, but these sort of conversations are are definitely part of um, part of part of our national conversation. Um, certainly, certainly, probably more so in Europe. There's concern about immigrant populations who just don't blend in, don't assimilate, don't integrate into the wider life of the community. Um, is that about culture? Is that about religion? Is it about racism? Um, there's, there's a lot of possibilities and, you know, what, and, and what do you do about that ends up being the, um, the, the sort of operative question here. Um, you know, this is, uh, it, it's a very similar situation in a sense to, if you fast forward a few thousand years to what Antiochus Epiphanes was dealing with in the, in the Hanukkah story, you've got a group of people who have distinctive laws, culture, religion, uh, and they view themselves as set apart and, 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 and different, um, and they just don't blend in. Is there any way we can make them blend in? And, and, and the, um, the Hellenistic approach was, uh, was very different from the Egyptian approach here, uh, but it is, it's, it's the same problem in a sense. I, I put problem in quote marks, but uh, it's, the same, uh, it's the same reality that by and large, you know, 
Jews just don't blend in completely. We we might you know start wearing you know the same clothes as everyone else, eat the same food more or less, but we do it in our own way. We might learn the language of uh, of our host country. Uh, we might even become very proud citizens of our of our of our new country, um, but we never set aside our Jewishness completely, um, or certainly the bulk of us don't set it aside completely, and it's 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 an open question how you how you deal with that how you resolve that there's sort of the egyptian approach here of uh, of, of population decrease and slavery there's the uh, the hellenistic approach of trying to tempt people in um or at least for a while that ultimately doesn't work the um you know not not to toot our own horns but the the american approach of um you know multi multi-faith multi-ethnic democracy where we become fully ourselves and fully at the same time an integrated piece of the larger whole that's pretty nice i i like that a lot i i, I think this is a this is a much better better approach but i um I, I, sympathy is not the right word but i understand what pharaoh's getting at here i i think he's not completely Full of nonsense like he actually is probably in his eye in his mind making a good point um and then and then the question is how do you how do you solve this problem how do you how do you deal with this in a way that's going to work for everyone and it's not it's not easy and where it becomes you know where it becomes evil uh we don't need to mince words here where it becomes truly wicked is in pharaoh's approach and what he does in response to this legitimate situation so let's take a look at that. Um, he says, so they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built garrison cities for Pharaoh, Pitom, and Ramesses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they increased and spread out so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. So Pharaoh's got a problem. There are too many of these foreigners living in his country, and he doesn't trust them on a military perspective. So he tries to sort of solve two birds with one stone. He's going to increase his military preparedness uh, by building fortresses, um, using a, a body of, uh, of, of slave labor from the Israelites, which it seems like he's hopeful this slave labor. Uh, and these harsh conditions are going to cause a decrease in the births. That there's going to be a demographic shift because when you when you're when you're hurting people, oppressing people, enslaving people, they tend not to have children. But that does not work out in this case at all. Um, I think the implication is pretty clear that this is this is the blessing of God falling on the children of Israel. That somehow, even in the midst of their oppression they continue to spread out and increase and have more have more children well it could also be an act of defiance i'm thinking about like here in this country it's like often what brings us all together is when there's an anti-semitic thing or the world's attacking it when israel's under attack that's when all of a sudden people kind of become more conscious of their jewishness and more oh sure sort of late jewish kind of or together absolutely absolutely yeah it, um, it 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 may be yeah it may be sort of the the intangible blessing of god or it may be intentional acts of defiance i think i think i think that's really i think that's that's really wise all right the egyptians ruthlessly imposed upon the israelites the various labors that they made them perform so not only did they make us do these things but they made they made life just harsher than it had to be while we were doing these things while we were engaged in this labor ruthlessly they made life bitter for them with harsh labor at mortar and bricks and with all sorts of tasks in the field and we turn the page and this is where it gets truly truly wicked the king of egypt spoke to the hebrew midwives one of whom was named shifra and the other pua saying when you deliver the hebrew women look at the birth stool if it is a boy kill him if it is a girl let her live so 
Pharaoh is getting more engaged here. He's uh, his previous plan didn't work, and now he's coming up with a more more direct plan of action, where um, he's simply he's simply ordering the 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 death, the murder of all of the Israelite boys. But the midwives, fearing God, did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing, letting the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. Before the midwife can come to them, they have given birth. And God dwelt, dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and increased greatly. And because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. Then Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every boy that is born you shall throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So, huh, it's a nasty story. It's a, it, 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 it's a heart-wrenching story. Um, Pharaoh's got a plan here, and he's trying to enlist these midwives in his evil plan, and they resist him. And there are, there are sort of a few things that come up in this context. One is the question, are there really two midwives for so many hundreds of thousands of Israelites? Um, and, and, and normally people say, no, they were just sort of like the chief midwives. They were the ones, they, they, they were the head of the midwives union, and, and, and they were tasked with getting the message out to, to the rest of them. Um, and then... As always with Midrash, we want to know identity. We want to know who these people are, what their story is. Um, are, are, are they found elsewhere? Normally this happens with anonymous characters. In this case, they're not anonymous. We do know their names, but they never come up again. And so the question is, who are Shifra and Pua? Um, and there is a Midrash that says, this is Yocheved and Miriam. Moses's mother and Moses's sister. And so this is a, um, I mean, we haven't even gotten to the birth of Moses yet. So this might be, in a sense, the righteous act that leads Yocheved to, uh, you know, to merit having, um, ha ha having such a, a, a righteous child. Um, there are um, voices that push back on that idea one is sort of more historical or political uh, sort of involved in the, the 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 current events of the time in the middle ages where there was a uh, a, a vast and there, there still is in some quarters there's a a, a vast amount of worship uh, or adoration of the virgin mary and there is a, a, a lot of energy in the Christian world that goes into the, the Virgin Mary. And some people um, had sort of wondered if maybe Jews were doing something similar with, um, with, with, with these stories that really emphasize the righteousness of Yocheved. Um, and, and this leads to a pushback that, um, that, that, that Yocheved is, um, that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with her. She doesn't do anything bad, but um, um, it it it, uh, it can get overemphasized. Uh, the, this idea that a a righteous leader, the redeemer, the savior of your people, um, must be born out of a uh, uh, a holy vessel, uh, must be born out of a woman of purity, a woman of of, of righteousness. Um, we, we, we don't really go for that uh, theologically. I mean, most of the prophets, most of, most of our great leaders, um, we don't know anything about their parents. And as, as far as we know, they go, their parents are fine. They're, there's no, they're, they're, they're good. They're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But they're, 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 we, we don't get into this like immaculate conception business or anything like that. So as these midrashim get more and more emphasized in medieval Europe, especially in Germany, there is a pushback on it as well. Um, and in this particular one, there the pushback here is that twice in the text we just read, it says that the midwives feared God. And so, I mean, who, like that's good, right? It's good to fear God. Um, and, 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 you know, it's notable. But the, um, the rabbis of the Middle Ages 
And again, th this is speaking in a context that might in many ways be quite foreign to us and how we relate to our non-Jewish neighbors. But they said, there's no reason at all to mention that a Jew fears God, because we just assume that's true. If you're Jewish, if you're an Israelite in the Torah, of course you fear God. The only reason to mention that someone fears God, and certainly the only reason to mention it twice, is because they're not Jewish. Okay, I mean, maybe, like, if you accept those axioms, then you get to, you get to where they get to. I don't, I don't know that I necessarily do. I've I've, I've, I've met a couple of Jews, so I wouldn't say feared God. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's possible. I think they're out there. Um, maybe in ancient days they weren't. I'm, I'm suspicious about that, that, that concept, though. But yeah, so, so by, by this uh, you know, set of principles, once you add everything up, if the Torah is mentioning that someone fears God, um, such as um, when, um, when, when, when Isaac and Rebecca go to Gerar, and um, they, the, there's, there's an incident with the king Abimelech, and you know, it seems like maybe he's trying to sleep with Rebecca. And Isaac says, well, I didn't think anyone here feared God. And so the, uh, the, 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 the context here is that fear of God often um, is absent in the non-Jewish world and is notable when it shows up. And so uh, Shifra and Pua are Hebrew midwives in the sense that they work for the Hebrews, they work for the Israelites, but they are not themselves Israelites. They are Egyptian women, um, uh, which is what makes it notable uh, here that they, they receive a reward from God. Uh, in verse 20, God dealt well with the midwives and the people uh, multiplied and greatly increased. And because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. So because of their, um, their righteousness toward the children of Israel, they receive the blessing of God, um, but that's sort of outside of the covenant. Um, or maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe they're part of the mixed multitude that leaves with um, with with Israel um, a few years later. It's we we don't we don't get any we don't get any real details on this. Um, it's more powerful that way, I think, because of course. If they're the Hebrew midwives, of course they're going to be saving the babies of their people. Sure. Whereas yeah. If they're Egyptians, you know, who might be feeling threatened or feeling more, you know, whatever connected with Pharaoh's line, it's a lot more risky and heroic for them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Risky either they, way, like, uh, but for them, right it's like the they've nation. got they've got more to lose than you know, enslaved people who are the midwives. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's worth noting um, that there are various midrashim that say both of these things, that it's, it's either Yocheved and Miriam or that these women are Egyptian. And obviously it can't be both. Um, and yet at the same time, it is both because that's how midrash works. It doesn't have to be consistent uh, either internally or externally. There, there, there's, uh, there's wisdom to be gleaned even from contradictory pieces of information. Uh, I'll say one more thing on this topic, um, which is, this is just, this is for you know, people in the English speaking world. Um, this is particularly notable. When the King James translating commission was sitting down and working on their English translation of the Christian Bible, they, um, they, they had a lot of sources in front of them, but their primary text, their primary Hebrew text for the Old Testament was a Mikro Gedolot that had been published in Venice. So the Mikro Gedolot is where you have the Hebrew text and then you have the commentaries on the sides. And so when the King James translators were working, they had Rashi in front of them. They, they had Rashbam, they, they had even Ezra. Um, and they, their first draft was something very similar in look, in feel. They had their translation in the English and then they had commentary on the sides. And one of the pieces of commentary on this chapter was a discussion from a biblical theological perspective on when it is 
permissible and required to disobey a command of the king. Because not only are the, uh, the, the midwives, you know, disobeying the order of, uh, of, of Pharaoh, but in a sense, um, certainly in, 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 in the, you know, in, in the concept of, of medieval and early modern Europe, they are disobeying the command of the, of the, the divinely installed king. And so when, when, in, when do you follow God by obeying God's, you know, moral code? And when do you obey God by obeying the king that God has installed? It's an interesting question, maybe not for us anymore, because we don't have a king here. But in their time, it was a very interesting question. But King James did not like the answer they came up with. He did not. I was about like to ask if he, let that, if he let that slide or if he said, nope, don't do it. He said, you need to change this. And they said, no, we're not changing it. And he said, fine, we're going to print the Bible without your commentary then. And that's why most copies of a King James Bible, it's just the text. There's no commentary. There's no notes on the bottom. There's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't look like this at all. There's not you know, this commentary and this super commentary. Um, I mean, you can find some like that. But the sort of standard set for the English language uh, for you know, more than what, 400 years now is the Bible is the word of God and here it is and that's all you need. Which is like from the Jewish perspective is, is pretty stupid, honestly. Like who could imagine that you just need to open this up and just look at the words with no historical context, with no teachers guiding you along, just look at the words and that's all you need. But that ends up being the situation because King James did not want the, um, the people to have this, uh, this sort of you know, authoritative doctrine of when it was legal to rebel against the king. Um, uh, and and, and you know, no surprise, the English Civil War was just around the corner. So, I mean, it's... Uh, um, you know, there, he, he probably had good reason. All right. That's a little aside. Um, we'll, we'll move on now to chapter two. This is, this is good stuff here. So chapter two, a certain man of the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. So in, in that's, that's the English here. In the Hebrew is Vayelech ish mi beit Levi. Uh, et bat Levi. So uh, the, the text is a little bit more um, specific in, in, in a literal translation. So a man from the house of Levi took a daughter of Levi. So the rabbis wonder if this shouldn't be understood um, literally, that uh, Yocheved is a daughter of Levi, rather than saying daughter of Levi means she is a woman from the tribe of Levi, which is probably what the text originally meant in its, uh, in its original context. Um, so the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket for him, coughed it with bitumen and pitch, she put the child into it and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to learn what would befall him. So this is a, um, yeah, this is, this is a tough, uh, this is a tough moment here. Um, the, the, the king has, uh, the Pharaoh has ordered all of the boys to be thrown into the river. And uh, this woman, who we, we know is Yocheved, although the text doesn't give names here, um, she, well, at first she refuses, but then she does end up, in a sense, um, obeying the king, right? King says, throw the babies in the river. She does. She just puts them into a basket first. She puts him into a basket that she has... She has, uh, you know, especially built with, um, with, uh, with, with special waterproofing technology, um, and and this is a um, this this is this is uh, likelier to keep him alive. Although still, 
problematic. Um, anyone who's had a three month old knows they are completely helpless, completely. They, they all, all they do is cry and eat and sleep and poop and that's it. And the idea that, that one of them could have any hope of surviving on their own is, um, is, 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 is ridiculous. Um, and so it seems like this woman has a plan though. This woman has got it, something figured out. Because you could ask the question, you know, why? Why did she wait for three months? And what is her plan now? Like why, 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 what, what made her change her mind? Or did she change her mind? Is this part of some, like I say, part of some, some plan? The text doesn't really tell us. I mean, it could just be that after three months, she said, I can't do this anymore. This isn't working out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of hiding. I'm skeptical about that, honestly. I, I you know, if, if you've gotten through the first three months, there would be such a bond, there would be such an attachment. I can't imagine an, a parent um, doing this with, uh, with, with, without, without, you know, some, some glimmer of hope for what is, um, what is happening here. Let's see. Um, in the Hebrew, I just want to point out that the word here, which is being translated as basket, um, you can see this in verse three, is teva or tevat gome, uh, which uh, wicker basket. Um, and this is the same word um, that, that, that is otherwise translated in the Noah story as ark. And so... We, we usually say Noah's Ark, even though we don't call anything else in modern English an Ark. Um, I mean, it's sort of entered the lexicon as, as the term for Noah's, Noah's boat. Um, but a Teva is simply a, um, like a box or a, like a, a very simple container, a very, very simple container. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's not a boat. It's not, it doesn't have a streamlined hull or something like that. The way the way Noah's Ark is described is that it's just simply a cube or or, or a like a rectangle. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have any, um, any 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 sort of features of a modern modern boat. Even though the the one in Kentucky looks very nice, it's not especially accurate. And here we see this is. On a on a on a, a literary world, a literary approach, there's something very similar happening here. The Noah's Ark, God simply tells Noah, like, build a simple box and get into it with all the animals, and I'll take care of you. And Noah seems pretty okay with this, uh, and it works. There's not a, a lot of planning involved. There's not a lot of um, you know. There's no mention of oars or a sail or anything like that. It's just get it, just build a box and you'll float around for a while and you'll be okay. And Noah is putting his faith in God that this is going to work out. Well, you'll have it's doing the same thing here. She is putting her faith in God that she can put a three month old baby into, um, in, in, into a very simple wicker basket and float, float him down the river and that something good is going to happen. Um, something, you know, or, or, or at the very least, something, something not terrible is going to happen. But just in case, she wants maybe she wants to um, have some, some you know, voice in the situation that's emerging, or maybe she just wants to see what happens next. Um, and that's why she has, um, she has the boy's sister station herself at a distance um, to see what's going to happen next. All right, the text goes on. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile while her maidens walked along the Nile, she spied the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw that it was a child, a boy crying. She took pity on it and said, this must be a Hebrew child. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a Hebrew nurse to suckle the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter answered, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me. I'll pay you wages. 
So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who made him her son. She named him Moses, explaining, I drew him out of the water. So there's a, there, there's a lot going on here. Da the daughter of Pharaoh has come down to bathe in the Nile. Um, why she would do that is a bit of a mystery, honestly. Um, she has access to slaves and servants, and probably they could draw her a bath that would be better than, uh, than going into the Nile River that's uh, infested with crocodiles and this sort of thing. But she goes down to the Nile, and um, it could be that she is going down to see what's going on there. It could be that she is going down out of concern. Her father is a truly wicked man who has ordered the execution of babies, and she is not going to turn the other way. She's going to look at it. She's going to see it with her own eyes. And um, there, there, there is a sort of uh, a sort of hint of um, you know of, of 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 righteousness here in what she what she is doing. And she sees the basket, and she opens it up, and she sees the boy. And, and, and her first comment is, this must be a Hebrew child. So she's very aware of the, of, of the you know, current events. She's aware of the situation in her country, aware of what her father has ordered. And she, she is able to put two and two together very, very quickly. Um, and then Moses's sister, Miriam, we don't know she's Miriam from this story. We just know the name. We don't know any names, just uh, just just relationships. But uh, the boy's sister uh, says to Pharaoh's daughter, um, hey, "Hey, do you need uh, do you need someone to feed this baby for you? Um, because it's hard to say exactly how long all of this takes place. But in a in a world where you can't just go get baby formula, you find a baby." It's going to be a challenge to try to take care of the baby and you know pharaoh's daughter no matter how much she she might uh you know be growing in love and attachment to this child she's not able to to feed it physically and so was this was this the plan all along was miriam supposed to suggest this so that yocheved could come be the wet nurse for her own son maybe maybe this was their plan I mean, if so, it was a long shot and it really worked out. Could it be that this was something that they, they were, they didn't plan it out, they, but when it, when it fell out this way, they were very happy about it and it, 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 it worked out. Um, hard to say, hard to say. But regardless, Yocheved and Miriam take the baby home uh, and take care of the baby um, uh, while, while, it is, uh, while it is nursing. Um, and it says, when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, who made him her son. So after the, so, so she puts the baby in the basket, baby floats down the river. What ends up happening is she ends up going home with her same baby. So uh, there's been this sort of transformation of status. And at the same time, everyone goes back to their, their, their same beds at the at the end of the night it's a strange sort of story and eventually she weans the child i think that's implied from the text uh, and, and and when she when she no longer needs to nurse the child she takes the the child to pharaoh's daughter and it's pharaoh's daughter who names moses it's pharaoh's daughter who gives him this name um and uh if if you if you look at the at the text here, um, it says, "Vatikra shemo Moshe, v'tomer ki min hamayim mishetehu." So, so she named him Moses, explaining, "I drew him out of the water." But that's that, that's not actually a great translation um, because there are two active verbs here. V'tikra shemo Moshe. That's all you need. That's all you need. You could just say she called him Moses. 
Um, and then the, it seems like uh, the, the, the Masoretic text wants to make this one sentence, but it's actually not another, it's, it's another sentence. Um, so, and she said, because from the water I pulled him. But this feels like uh, textually maybe a later edition. And in fact, there have been scholars who said Vatikra Shemo Moshe is perhaps not the naming of Moses because Moshe means son in Egyptian. So they're doing a Hebrew drash here from the word pulling out uh, that she drew him out of the water. Um, but in fact, the Egyptian um, drash would be that she is calling him son. And so what we're seeing here is the adoption ceremony. And so Moses might have not been actually called Moses. Um, it would, it, it's, it's a weird, it, it'd be weird to call your, call your son, son. Um, and that's, that's his name. Like, oh, this is my son, son. Uh, people don't really do that in English. And I don't think they did it in Egyptian either. And so what we could be looking at here is a, a, a fragment of the, of the adoption ceremony um, that has been translated into Hebrew and simply, and simply lost in, uh, lost in his comprehension by a later generation who didn't speak Egyptian. Who had uh, who had no idea what was uh, what was going on here, and came up with this um, with this explanation that it means drawing out of the water. All right, that was that was a lot. That was fun. <laughs> Any questions about this or thoughts, concerns? What just what just occurred to me this last little part I'd never thought about it before. How did Pharaoh's daughter explain this to Pharaoh that she has this foreign kid? It's an interesting question, right? I mean, and she, there's no reference here to her having um, a husband. Um, were, were, were single women adopting babies back then? I mean, it's, uh, it, 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 it's possible, I suppose. Um, it, feels, it feels more like a 21st century thing to do. Um, and there, there, there's no real explanation of um, what was her motive? What was her relationship? Was she, you know, did she live in, in the courts? Presumably she did, but uh, there's, there's a lot that's sort of left ambiguous here. And um, there's so much, in fact, that doesn't seem to drive the story forward. That, um, you know, you, you, you don't see in a later chapter where God, you know, at the burning bush, maybe God could say to Moses, you know, Moses says, oh, I'm, I'm was slow of speech or whatever he says. And maybe God could reply, yeah, but you grew up in the court of Pharaoh, so you're the perfect one to send down. <laughs> that never happens. That doesn't come up. It seems like uh, Moses shows up in Pharaoh's court and no one has any idea who he is. It doesn't seem like a homecoming. Um, except in the movies, of course, but in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the text itself, um, this all seems like extraneous information, um, which, uh, which, which, you know, on a literary level, it makes you wonder why, what's going on. Um, if, if you want to um, have any hope that this might be a historical text, um, it actually adds more depth to the, um, to, to, to the historicity. Nobody believes this is actually true, by the way, but there was a time I shouldn't say nobody, but no scholars, scholarship has moved well beyond this. Um, but there was a time um, in the 19th century when people read this little passage we just looked at and, and they, they, they came up with a pretty, pretty wild story that Moses, um, Moses was the Pharaoh Akhenaten. And so, <laughs> and they said, oh, you can see here, he's like, he grows up in Pharaoh's court and he's, he's, He's a he's a Semitic man who is adopted by by you know, Pharaoh's daughter and 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 he he brings with him the 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 Israelite concept of the one God and and so the the Exodus story is actually like a like a like a, a, a garbled retelling of the civil war that happened uh, when Akhenaten became Pharaoh and was eventually murdered and uh, replaced with uh, Tutankhamun so. 
like I say, nobody really thinks this is, this is true, but um, there, there's, there's a lot of sort of grasping at, uh, at little, little tiny nuggets in here. And there is an overlay of Egyptian material that does point to some knowledge, some intimate knowledge of life in Egypt, the Egyptian language, Egyptian culture. Um, so there's, there's definitely something going on. So, so Rabbi, I, I have something. Oh, so, please. You, uh, yeah, Rebecca mentioned about, you know, why didn't Pharaoh question, and, but I got a better one. Why didn't the families of the Israelites that were thrown in the, you know, that were killed, why didn't, weren't they jealous of, of Moses's family, you know? And then how far did that jealousy, and I, I'm thinking they probably were jealous because they basically lost their firstborns, but, you know, Moses's family did not lose their firstborn, obviously. So, and, and how far did that carry into some of the, the disagreements and jealousy and pettiness, you know, as the Israelites were wandering the desert, you know, so could, could, you know, it's not unlike, you know, Miriam and Aaron who, you know, were punished, you know, Miriam for, for her criticism and, and Aaron lost, you know, two of his sons. So I'm, I'm just wondering, did that, did that play into it in any, in any fashion? Uh, it certainly could have. I mean, it certainly could have. We, we have this story in front of us and we don't know the thousands of other stories. Maybe there were other families who figured out different ways to hide their children. We, 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 don't, we don't have those stories. I think we could, we could read this as saying, this is the only time it happened. All the other boys were killed. We don't have to read it that way. Um, it could just be that all those other stories are, are, are lost to us. Um, and, 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 it, and it does seem like, like later, there are there are plenty of um, plenty of Israelite men uh, for Moses to um, to get upset with and to have fights with, um, and so this uh, this plan of of killing all of the men by killing all of the boys it does not seem to have worked out. It doesn't seem to come come to fruition um, demographically. But but yeah, certainly there there's there's plenty there, there there's plenty of anxiety around Moses's special status. Um, and and, and I, I think you could, you could read it as being the special relationship that Moses has with God, beginning with the burning bush, but you could read it going even further back that this family has always seemed to receive special treatment. And maybe that's, maybe that's sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, one of the many burrs under Korach's saddle. Um, it's, it's, it's possible. I think, that's a, I think that's a really, that's a really interesting way to read it. Oh, and then one last thing about, and then we don't really talk about Laban too much. And, you know, Laban was, you know, a, a Jewish taskmaster, ma master, I'm sorry. Uh, but he appeared to be around the same age as Moses. So yet, how was he able to survive, you know, the killing of the firstborn uh, or the males? And, and yet, you know, other ones weren't. So, and I, I, I've never read any commentary about that, but Again, this is just my perception that, you know, he seems like around the same age. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, the, um, for, for me, you know, when, when I read this text, I mean, what, what have we got? We've got Pharaoh comes up with a plan to kill all the boys. And it doesn't work because the midwives don't permit it. And then Pharaoh comes up with another plan to throw them in the river and then the story, which has been like a big story, zooms down to being one family story because there's going to be one boy who ends up in the river and he is the, the one we're interested in. Uh, you know, this, this is going to become the Moses story. I think you can read that as an, there's sort of an implication that this second plan to kill all the boys is going to be as much of a failure as the first one. Possibly, I don't know. I, I I I think the text is a little a little ambiguous, but we don't. I don't think we have to imagine that this plan worked very well. Okay. All right, so we're gonna have to wrap it up. But I want to thank everyone for for coming and um, for uh, just uh, as a reminder, we're gonna try to get this on the uh, up up on 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 the. the 
what am I, the YouTube, the YouTube group, uh, YouTube channel. And so uh, this will be hopefully up in the next few days. And uh, if, uh, if you think people might have enjoyed this uh, conversation, but they couldn't come uh, at this time, I hope you'll, uh, you'll recommend they check us out on YouTube.